US farmer Major Johnson & Johnson will not enforce its patent on the TB drug, Pedaquiline. How did uh, the company come to make this announcement? And what does it mean for millions of TB patients uh, around the world, but particularly in low and middle income countries? The US House of Representatives is looking for a new speaker after Kevin McCarthy was voted out. Uh, why did this happen and who might replace him? And uh, we find out why Guatemalans, particularly indigenous communities, are on an indefinite national strike demanding the removal of the country's attorney general. Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you from a different setting today uh, because the Delhi police's uh, special cell raided uh, the People's Dispatch and News Click offices and have sealed uh, the office as well as the studio from which we normally operate. Uh, but we're using uh, the internet to continue our coverage on Daily Debrief and on peoplesdispatch.org. Uh, if you haven't already, this is a good time to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And of course, uh, also share this video with your friends. Our first story is a big one. US-based uh, pharma major Johnson & Johnson, as I was saying a little while ago, has announced that it will not enforce uh, its patents on Certuro, which is its brand name uh, for the salt bedaquiline, uh, which is a path-breaking tuberculosis medicine, uh, the first drug of its kind uh, to be approved for wide usage in uh, about four decades. Uh, it offers the opportunity uh, to uh, sort of increase access to TB medication uh, for millions of patients around the world. Uh, and this will apply in 134 countries, low and middle income countries. Uh, it's the result of sustained campaigns, sustained pressures from multiple groups and uh, also uh, comes soon after the Indian Patents Office rejected an application for a secondary pa a patent on the drug by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, joining us with all the details is uh, Jyotsna Singh, uh, health journalist Jyotsna Singh, who has been on the show uh, frequently. Jyotsna, good to have you uh, on Daily DB, uh, DB sorry, as always. Um, tell us first how this came about, uh, Jyotsna, before we uh, talk about the massive impact that it's likely to have on the treatment of TB. So, firstly, I think uh, congratulations to you all for actually doing this uh, uh, Daily Debrief despite all the problems that have been imposed by the the government and the Delhi uh, uh, police as a special cell. So this is great. Uh, and thanks for calling me. Um, so yes, um, it is a really big development in the field of medicine and health sector. Uh, after decades, we have received uh, uh, something. We have been able to break patent barriers, uh, which will give access to uh, a lot of patients across the world. Before this, it happened in the in the early 2000s when the HIV when the HIV medicines actually went. Um, uh, there was a fight and uh, generic versions of those medicines came about. So it's a big deal. Um, but it, this is no charity by the company. It is not that their hearts have changed. Uh, it has come, as you said, uh, after a lot of struggle, a lot of struggle. I remember I started writing on this topic and started working in 2016. Uh, since then, uh, so many organizations and individuals have fought and the TB survivors and the TB patients have uh, fought since 2016, at least or maybe before that, uh, to really have this medicine uh, cheap and accessible and available to everyone who needs it. Uh, so that is the thing. Um, so just to ensure to tell you what the issue was, um, Johnson & Johnson is the company which has, uh, which is the originator company for this medicine, Bidacolin, uh, which is a very, very important uh, medicine for uh, drug resistant TB. And before that, if you do not have this medicine in your treatment regimen, uh, then you are dependent on certain other medications which have terrible side effects. Something like an injectable called Kenamide which leads to permanent hearing loss. Uh, there are medicines which give you psychosis, make you suicidal. So we need to replace those medicines and this particular medicine has a very good safety profile. But uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, uh, held the patent over the medicine. So uh, normally 
uh, something what is called primary patent that is a basic patent on a medicine it lasts for 20 years so for 20 years a company has complete monopoly over the medicine they only manufacture it they only sell it uh, after that, that what kicks in is called secondary patent where just by tweaking the medicine very less like very little uh, tweaks uh, the company can do and extend this patent for many more years uh, in this case it would have been for five years so they wanted five more years after having after having had the monopoly for 20 years they wanted more um, and that is what the secondary patent which was uh, they applied for across the world despite uh, hue and cry by so many people including uh, patients affected by tp so they did that um but um, then uh, in the past few months quite a few things happened uh, so as i said that people have been fighting since 2016 which has forced the governments also to take uh, a stand finally on these issues so the indian patent office rejected the secondary patent application of this medicine and uh, the that patent opposition was actually filed by two very courageous women who both survived uh, extreme drug resistant tb somehow but has faced uh, terrible side effects they went to the court mm -hmm. saying that we suffered it others should not uh, so right. they and uh, so that was a big uh, victory then uh, after this the ukrainian and the and the Belarus governments they actually asked johnson and johnson to drop this uh, secondary patent in their countries and after that the south african uh, uh, government's competition commission that is their uh, body it has actually launched an investigation uh, uh, for uh, NJ, uh, on jnj uh, on the pricing of the medicine and on asking for secondary patent so there was a lot of pressure on jnj finally that came up uh, and um, uh, as in one of the shows, uh, John Green, uh, the famous American writer and YouTuber, he said that, you know, uh, we have had these medicines for a long time. You just have to give it to the patients and they will be saved. If they still die, it is because of the system. It is because of something else. And in, for the drug resistant TB patients, for a lot of them, it was this medicine, which was uh, one of uh, the medicines which was the reason so yes so it is good that the johnson and johnson has said it will not have secondary patents already there are three companies uh, from india who have the capacity to produce these medicines and it will happen and just very shortly to give you a few numbers so uh, uh you, we have something around mm -hmm. 1.6 million uh drtb patients every year uh, uh, uh in the world um and um if you look at the data, J, uh, uh, not more than 10 to 15 percent of them have actually got this medicine, though it should have been given to all of them. So, so that is uh, wh where we are. More companies also mean more production, not only the price drop, which is very important, uh, but also more competition. In terms of price, uh, vice, uh, uh, we talked about South Africa, so I'm just giving an example. In South Africa, Bidacolin per patient costs uh something like 285 sorry to interrupt you i i don't it's uh, my internet but we're having a bit of uh, trouble with your audio uh could you just uh, take us through the last bit that you said uh, once more please uh so the, if we talk about the pricing in that sense uh hmm. how cost with is uh so in uh in south africa it costs something hmm. uh, uh, like us dollars 285 per patient and it is only one of the medicines out of a cocktail of four to six which are to be given to the patient uh, so right. the, if we add the cost it becomes a lot more than this um, so now it will be cheaper and uh, Indian generics when they start to produce we'll have yeah. more uh, courses being produced we will have cheaper uh, courses in the uh, for patients to grab and so it will be good and we should really thank the activists and the TB survivors who have continued to fight for this. Right. So, so, and, and by as much as uh, two thirds, uh, perhaps the cost uh, of the overall the medication can be reduced, uh, Josna, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, very quickly, because we're almost out of time. Very quickly, if you can tell us uh, what happens next. This is uh, by no means, of course, uh, the end in in uh, the struggle to get. TB medicines to patients? Uh, yes. Uh, so we still uh, have many more things where the prices should come down. One major thing is that the test 
for uh, 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 drug resistant TB. Uh, that is by this company called CFID, which is uh, uh, which is uh, one of the subsidiaries of Dana. Uh, it costs a lot. They were charging uh, ten US dollars per test. Uh, they brought down the price a few weeks ago to eight dollars. But actually. Uh, even if they uh, get a uh, reasonable profit, uh, they should uh, not be charging more than five uh, US dollars for that. So that has right. to still come down and the government and the company has to take uh, a stand. Uh, then there is another medicine called, De called Delaminate, uh, which is by a Japanese company called Otsuka. It is actually costlier than Bidacolin. And that is one medicine which is very safe for mm. children. And when I said that you what are the problems with older medicines so there is this injection which you have to take daily if you do not have delaminate uh, or bidacolin uh, mm. and there are children mm. who are given these uh, injections for six months every day once a day uh, so to stop all that to happen delaminate is a very important medicine uh, but still there is no commitment from otsuka to drop the price or uh, to give up the patent that has to happen uh pritomenate is a third drug uh, which is also, uh, there are patent claims on it across the world uh, that again has to be fought and the companies should be asked to drop their patents and stop the IP barrier for all of this. Um, I think if all of this happens, then we can actually think of eliminating TB and not before that. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Josna, for kicking off uh, the show with that actually uh, really important and, and historic in many ways. Uh, story and, and hopefully it continues and we'll have you back uh, very soon I'm sure uh, we're moving on now to uh, the US where uh, the speaker of the House of Representatives has been voted out in what was a right-wing revolt uh, within the Republican Party Nish uh, is with us and will tell us hopefully uh, what this means because this is one of the most important uh, political jobs in the United States um, Anish, good to have you on debrief. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, uh, like considering the situation. Up, what yes. happened, yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 just take us through uh, uh, the process. Uh, Anish, it seems to be the culmination of of a, a, a sort of uh, I don't know a thing within the Republican Party and McCarthy that's been ongoing for quite some time. Yes, I mean, uh, we did the election itself, uh, McCarthy's election, and how it took about about 15 rounds of election for him to actually secure the uh, the seat, uh, and it came pretty much with this one uh, major uh, concession, which was that a single member in the House can actually initiate a, a removal process for the speaker, a no confidence process that we would call in our parliamentary system. And uh, it clearly has come to uh, bite him uh, right now. And right, uh, and this is kind of historic in many ways because it's the first time that a speaker has been removed uh, while the, uh, the legislature, the US Congress was in session. And that pretty much brings uh, the entire process of legislation, of federal le legislation, into completely uncharted territory because they never had this system of having to deal with, uh, uh, you know, a temporary uh, speaker or, uh, or they, I mean, like even the constitution and the legal system is pretty much very vague on how uh, this legal, sorry, this temporary uh, speaker is going to function. Uh, but obviously uh, the fight or the, the infighting that we see is within the Republican camp is pretty much coming from a very interesting set of uh, issues. Uh, uh, first of all, we see that the, you know, it, this was a very small minority that actually uh, brought about this uh, vote, uh, barely about eight people who are, uh, from the Republican Party who voted uh, in favor of removing McCarthy. Uh, the rest of the votes were pretty much Democrats. So the small group of people belong to, uh, as we all know, from the Freedom How, uh, the Freedom Caucus uh, within the Republican Party, which is basically the very far right, uh, you know, very uh, usually known as the most pro-Trump uh, section within the Republican Party, and they are the ones who have been calling for a set of uh, 
cuts, major cuts in government funding and also, uh, you know, spending on the Ukraine war. And it's quite interesting the kind of issues that have come up uh, because of this uh, entire process. Uh, and it pretty much shows the kind of divide that even the the most rapid right uh, within the United States is going through, uh, the kind of confusion it is going through uh, within the elite, uh, the ruling class and, uh, you know, the U.S. establishment itself. Uh, so, Anish, uh, given the importance of, of the job of the speaker and, and the kind of uh, level of seniority that the speaker of the house occupies, uh, what happens next and uh, who is likely to replace McCarthy? Uh, it's a very difficult thing to say uh, who will be next because uh, pretty much there's nobody uh, right now who has a very clear uh, support from across the section. What we're seeing is a very clear divide that is not uh, very easily reconcilable within the Republican Party. And obviously the Democrats are having a field time of their own. But uh, if things do not uh, fall in place by, say, early November, uh, even they might be in panic because that is pretty much the deadline for uh, for uh, the temporary spending uh, bill that McCarthy passed, which was the reason why he was kicked out of the office for gaining uh, democratic support. Uh, and, so, uh, and so if they do not have a speaker by then, uh, they might not be able to uh, pass a spending bill and which brings the government into a shutdown, a partial shutdown, but most importantly, first ever uh, default in the over $31 trillion of U.S. Uh, national debt. And so that is a major uh, problem that like it's a ticking time bomb right now that the entire house has been brought into. And it pretty much is a situation where the Congress has been uh, you know, you know, kept hostage by a small uh, group of right wingers who are not, let's remember, who are not that radically different from their, uh, you know, other conservative uh, counterparts within the Republican Party or even many of the establishment Democrats uh, in the U.S. Congress, because uh, considering many of their policies itself. Uh, but uh, it's just that how, uh, uh, you know, averse to concessions that this small group are is what concerns the u.s ruling class and this you know pretty much exposes a whole lot of flaws within the u.s congressional presidential system uh the manner in which things function but also it exposes fault lines that uh, that was always simmering within the ruling uh, classes and that pretty much uh, is a situation now so you have obviously jim jordan coming in uh, who is the leader of the Freedom Caucus? But then there's also Skellies, who's the uh, the House uh, Majority Leader. If you look at them, they're not that radically different. Both of them had are very vehement uh, Trump supporters and pretty much uh, supported most of his uh, you know policies while in presidency. So they're not that very different from each other. So we do not know what kind of change we can expect in the coming days, or if there is going to be a timely change uh, for the Speaker's position. Mm. All right, thanks very much, Anish, and I'm sure you'll keep uh, tracking that uh, for us. Uh, next up, and our final story for the day, uh, Guatemalans have taken to the streets and are on uh, a national strike, prim primarily Guatemala's indigenous communities. They're on an indefinite national strike that began uh, on Monday. The strike was called last week, and it's been called in protest to demand the resignation of uh, Attorney General Consuelo Pojas. Uh, for her attempts to intervene in the country's election results uh, this year. Zoe Alexandra has been tracking that story. And uh, let's go over to her now to find out what's going on. Zoe, good to have you on Debrief. Uh, hope you're well. Uh, tell us what's happening in uh, in Guatemala at the moment. And, and uh, since it's been on since Monday, what sort of progress has the strike made? Well, it's a super crucial story. Um, and as you said, we've been tracking it at People's Dispatch uh, in essentially this uh, repression uh, against the Semilla party of the uh, presidential elect Bernardo Arevalo, which uh, is essentially the, the, these protests are against um, the actions that are being taken by the attorney general against this president elect and his party. Um, and this all started uh, in the first round of the presidential elections in the country. 
uh, where Bernardo Arevalo, who is from a center-left anti-corruption party, uh, came in first in the first round. And this was very shocking that he would be going to the second round of the elections. Uh, many of the establishment politicians uh, were thought that they had it in the bag. They've been able to rule over Guatemala for years um, and all of the privileges that that comes with. And so as soon as they saw that someone like Bernardo Arevalo, who uh, consistently speaks out against corruption, who has really allied himself uh, with uh, the movements in the country who has tried to take a stand against establishment politicians, um, when they saw his rise, they said, okay, we need to use all of the instruments that are disposable at our disposal to act. And so starting then, um, the, the prosecutor, the attorney general, um, began a campaign of criminalization against this party, suspending um, the legal representative of the party, attempting to make the party um, kind of uh, inexistent, inconstitutional, saying that it doesn't have legal status. Um, mm -hmm. Even actions uh, taken against Arevalo himself. Uh, going into the second round of the elections, uh, I think the, the legal status of uh, his parties, uh, Movimiento Semilla, didn't even exist. But again, he still went to the elections and won the second round of the elections against former First Lady Sandra Torres. Uh, and again, one of the first thing he said is that he's going to defend his presidency and he's going to defend the votes of all of the people in Guatemala who, who, who voted for him um, and that he wouldn't tolerate attempts by the right wing uh, to basically invalidate this election. And since then, since his victory, these attacks against him have increased. Um, and it's been interesting because as you said, the, uh, the protesters now are demanding the respect of the electoral results and also the resignation of the prosecutor because it's essentially been sort of this, this conflict and this dispute between different, uh, not different branches of power, but different institutions within kind of the legal system. So we see on one hand, the Supreme Electoral Court is validating their results and saying that yes, indeed, uh, Movimiento Semilla can exist, it is a party, they won the elections, um, these are the results. And then we have uh, another court saying that no, um, you know, these charges have to be uh, carried out against him. Um, and that, you know, so it's been this kind of back and forth. Um, this week, for example, a bunch of lawyers uh, brought a letter to the Constitutional Court um, and asking them to kind of uh, to reverse uh, these moves that the courts have taken against the party Movimiento Semilla. Um, currently, Arevalo is in the uh, United States meeting with all sorts of different representatives uh, to, to ask for their support, to say that uh, he, you know, he won the elections fair and square and that democracy has to be respected. Um, what's interesting in this case is that um, there's sort of been unanimous international consensus in saying that Arevalo did indeed uh, win these elections and that all of these attempts, for example, by Sandra Torres to not even respect these electoral results uh, you know, are undermining democracy. We've seen State Department officials say this. We've seen uh, officials from Europe say this. So there's kind of complete international consensus that what's happening now does constitute, um, you know, what the U.S. would say is an attack on democracy, maybe undermining democracy, and what uh, people in Guatemala are saying is a pending coup. And so that's why we've seen people on the streets saying, uh, you know, these attacks continue uh, they've consistently protested, and now they're actually going to this national strike to say uh, no more. Uh, we demand that our votes be respected. We demand that uh, these legal bodies do not be used uh, in this kind of lawfare scheme to invalidate their votes um, to to mm. attack the president elect. Uh, Zoe, how are things likely to proceed uh, over the over the next few days? Well, as I said, because there is this sort of international consensus saying that Arevalo did in fact win the elections, the Supreme Electoral Court, which I uh, neglected to mention, but has suffered several different raids, actually. Um, the authorities have raided the Electoral Court, taking material, etc. Um, and so I think that we are going to see that this situation will continue to escalate, especially as people march uh, towards the capital city. Uh, protests are expected to intensify. Um, when Arevalo returns from the United States, I'm sure that he's having uh, important meetings with legislators, with uh, different uh, think tanks, et cetera, to kind of get this uh, support. Um, 
But it, it seems unlikely and it seems difficult that the right wing will actually be able to sustain uh, this attack on him and that, in fact, he will not be. Uh, it seems likely that, you know, the, the transition of power will continue, um, that he will be sworn in as president. Um, but I think what's crucial is um, and that we've a lesson that has been learned, I think, by progressive rulers in Latin America over the past several years is that it is so crucial to maintain the pressure on the streets because uh, the right wing will use all of the tools at their disposal. Uh, if they've been in power, they've definitely made maneuvers to occupy the courts, to occupy, occupy all possible spaces of power. And that even if the executive is occupied by a progressive, um, they have all these other tools at their disposal, which they, they will use. And so I think that uh, the streets, which are historically of uh, the people and progressive movements and those who want change and fight for change, uh, have to be, are, mm. I think, are recognized as an important tool uh, in order to kind of maintain and consolidate power and show that the people are on the side of, um, of democracy and of having their votes respected and that, you know, if this yeah. doesn't happen, uh, there will be a response by on the streets. On the streets. Uh, and, and I think that's a great note, actually, to wrap up this episode of Daily Reviews. Thanks very much, uh, Zoe, as always, for being on the show and, of course, for uh, the work that you do. Uh, we'll be back with another episode, hopefully, same time, same place, uh, tomorrow. Uh, but, again, uh, take this opportunity to ask you once more to uh, support us and the work that we do, that people like reporters like Zoe do. Uh, by subscribing to the channel, of course. Uh, you can also head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Stay safe.